Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, before I get to the episode um, with Tom Broback, I just wanted to apologize for hitting record a bit too late. Um, our podcast took place on a Friday night, and uh, I'd been up fairly, fairly early. Um, you know, the kids in the middle of the night that that weren't feeling a hundred percent, and uh, myself as well. You know, I wasn't. I wasn't feeling a hundred percent either and I uh, wasn't really with it um, as much as I, as much as I normally am or, you know, I was a bit fatigued and whatnot. So, um, so this podcast took place in the evening time and uh, you know, it was just a little foggy and whatnot, but uh, anyway, I just want to give you a little heads up there and I'm still getting the hang of the whole podcasting game. So um, for next time, I'll make sure that I, I hit record on time so that you can hear everything that took place. But overall, um, really good podcast. Really enjoyed sitting down and uh, talking with Tom for a little bit and uh, getting his perspective from a physical therapy standpoint about training. So hope you enjoy the show. And then one third. One third is your um, older population, total knees, things like that. Um, so I see a variety of stuff throughout the day, which actually really helps because then you have a ton of energy for the younger kids and then you get some adult conversations with the older people. So keeps me balanced, keeps me happy. Um, yeah, no, it's been, uh, yeah. So living in Minnesota, I've always been here. I've always wondered what it'd be like to live out West or out East and, uh, maybe I'll have to do that sometime, but right now I'm stuck in the Midwest or not stuck. I choose to be in the Midwest and, uh, I like it. It's good. So you went to school. You went to school in the Twin Cities somewhere? I did. So I went to, uh, there's a Division three school, St. John's uh, in Minnesota. And then I went to University of Minnesota for physical therapy school. Oh. So I was in Minneapolis for PT school. And then I lived in either Minneapolis or St. Paul uh, basically ever since. Um, so yeah, if you're ever in Minnesota, let me know. Yeah, man. I've been uh, been through that airport the past couple times. Or, okay. Um, I think twice in the past six months. Okay. But man. Just the airport, like you know, you can you can spend quite a bit of time there. It's really nice and clean and huge. So uh, I don't know, but uh, yeah, man. So did you uh, did you make your way down to uh, Gophers weight room at all when Beats? And oh my Beats gosh! Like so you're <laughs> when I was in physical therapy school, I did not know who Cal Beats was, mm -hmm. which uh, it, believe it or not, and when I got out of school, I started reading stuff on trifecta training on RPR. Um, and obviously Cal Dietz's name came up and I was like, wow, this guy like does a lot. I wonder where he works. And it's like, Oh, University of Minnesota, I've been there a while, works a lot of sports. Um, and then always made an effort or always tried to make an effort to get down there and it just never happened. And then with COVID and, and whatnot, just, it hasn't happened yet, but he is, a wealth of knowledge. I've heard him speak at several conferences. I went down to uh track football consortium in Iowa this past summer and he he talked down there and the the levels his brain gets to is just unbelievable with how he thinks about programming and athletics and the weight room. And uh yeah, so he's been a uh especially at the RPR side, he's been a big influence on me. Uh are you a big fan of him? Yeah, man, I, I love his stuff. I read I think I read the triphasic book you know, in, in like a week because I just couldn't pull myself away from it because they were all, it was just a, a different way of looking at training, you know? And then, uh, the, the RPR, I did that, that level one aspect, uh, in the past year sometime and started implementing it with my athletes and, you know, it, it looks, and I warned them ahead of time. I'm like, it's going to look goofy, but just, just trust it. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you test it out on guys and you're like, look, I don't know if you can feel this, you know, we're going to push here, pull here, and we've got pretty big asymmetry. So in, at the end of the day, if you spend less than two minutes and you think it's BS, you know, whatever, we're out two minutes, who cares? But um, what got my attention with that RPR stuff is the number of soft tissue injuries they saw. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what really jumped out at me. So I've heard that from so many coaches where they go, they'll go down to zero. You know, we had zero soft tissue injuries this year. And that's just unbelievable. Whether you're a high school program, college program, or, or obviously in the pros, uh, it's amazing to decrease uh, those injuries because kids, 
the best, you know, ability is availability. And when you're in high school, um, at least for me, so my sophomore year, I broke my foot or broke my ankle in, in football in the second week of football. And then I had a hernia in basketball. So for almost like half the year, half of the sports calendar, I wasn't able to play or I was coming back from injury. And then also my senior year, our quarterback tore his ACL. And when you're in high school, like quarterback's a big part of your team. And so half of my, you know, my sophomore and senior year was really affected by injuries. So anything to help decrease injuries uh, makes a big impact on me because I personally went through it. And I see so many athletes, their careers are shaped and defined whether or not they get hurt or not. And if something like RPR, it's really simple, really easy to learn. Uh, if kids benefit from it, I'm all for it. Yeah. Yeah, there's there another course I went to down in Albuquerque called DNS. And, you know, like you're in this real small group, you know, there's like 12 people and an instructor and you know, you're, you're reading the slides and watching the stuff and the whole time you're just like, eh, I don't know, I don't know. And then, you know, you're following the path and it's like, all right, this, I can see how this ties in. This makes sense. And, you know, I stack that right after we do the RPR. You know, we do a general warm-up, then RPR, and then, or excuse me, we do RPR, then uh, general warm-up, then uh, DNS. But, uh, yeah, man, I mean, there's just so much that we don't know. And it's it's just i don't want to say discouraging at times but you're like yeah i'm I'm very certain about this and then right and then you know like a year later somebody looks at something new and you're like okay uh, i need to reevaluate what i thought i knew it's just it's it it is a blessing and curse right like you want to be confident you want to be on top of your game you want to know everything that's out there but the, the hard part, it's like always changing. So you can never be still for too long. You always have to be reading your research, talking to other coaches, trying new things. Um, but it's so much opportunity to grow, to get better, to learn from others, to help educate other people. Um, but it is tricky, right? You want to be, hey, this is the best program in the world. And six months later, it's like, wow, I didn't even think of this concept or someone brought it up in a different way. And now I have to utilize it more because it's a better option. And I think if we just stick to what we always do, uh, to some degree, that's not very good because, you know, six months ago, I probably didn't know everything and I don't know everything now. Um, but if you keep learning, keep growing, that's, that's a sign of being a really good coach. Yeah. Yeah, man. Like the, uh, there's a book I'm reading right now called what doesn't kill us. And it's, it's by Scott Carney and it dives deeper into like Wim Hof and all the, all the stuff he has going on. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's just amazing, man, because he's Wim Hof is just challenging, you know, what we think we know about the body. And like, hey, if we give it this stimulus, we have a high degree of certainty that it's going to elicit this response. And then a guy like Wim Hof comes along and they give that dose and they don't get the response they intended. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, well, well, why is that? And then they dive in and test and test and test. And. It's like, all right, well, we need to completely reevaluate what we thought was like basic physiology. And, you know, it just in reading this book, man, like I'm only like about halfway through it. There's so much that I've learned this week of just, you know, how the body will, you know, utilize, utilize fat for heat, you know, and it's different among different cultures, you know, throughout the, mm-hmm. in different parts of the world. But um, anyway, bit of it. Bit of a I think tangent I think no 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 I think one is- interesting thing is we kind of assume everyone reacts and responds like I do, so I respond very well to sunlight and to heat. So I really like saunas. I like being outside. I like summer. I like doing that stuff. Other people respond better to cold, or they respond better to uh, different stimulus. So we're all wired a little bit different. We're all a little bit unique. Um, someone in North America might be very different responder than someone who's in Asia or Australia. Um, so I think assuming everyone is going to react the same is one of, it's a common, like easy thing to fall into. Right. And a lot of your friends and family are probably similar to you and they have similar experiences. But once you start meeting other people who've had different experiences or respond in different ways, I think that opens up 
our brain to, Hey, not everyone is the exact same kind of like with yeah. what you're talking about with Wim Hof. It's like, oh, this guy responds differently. Why is that? Do other people like that. How do we get to that? And what does that tell us about our assumptions of humanity? Yeah. Yeah. Cause in, in the book, they're talking about, you know, if you, if you look at Inuit population mm-hmm. there, so I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was, uh, their culture requires a high amount of dexterity, you know, so, uh, their body will, will sit at a, at a slightly lower core temperature so that the extremities can have the blood flow so that they can have the dexterity necessary oh, wow. to, yeah. to go about their daily lives or whatever. Whereas I can't remember the other, the other population that they compared it to, but the other population did not require the dexterity. So mm-hmm. the body shunted the blood from the extremities and kept the core at a slightly higher temperature, uh, both exposed to cold, but two entirely different responses. And, you know, you, you start thinking about it and you're like, okay, is this, is this cultural? Is this regions of the world? What is going on? Um, and then, and then just from a conditioning standpoint, like how conditioned are you to, to heat or to cold or to whatever? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, there, the, the chapter I just read, they were diving into, people with uh, autoimmune disorders and diseases and how the cold is such a shock to their system that it forces them to, to quote unquote, wake up or uh, focus on those parts of their body. But anyway, is that like a survival mechanism? I, I'm not sure. I need to, okay. I need to read more into that, but um, yeah, the, the, there's a guy in there with uh, Parkinson's who's talking about, He's had Parkinson's for 14 years, and he does this daily breathing routine and daily ice baths, and it's just such a shock that he has to focus on what he's doing, and then for some reason it helps him limber up. And I don't know; it's it's just a, and I I don't think it's a one off. Uh, I don't think it's a one off outlier situation. I think it, there's as we see more and more people dive into this and do it probably see more stories that are similar to this that ties in a little bit to what we first started talking about with the uh being present right and i think some of these um not they're they're definitely not new like but they're becoming more popular i should say whether it's uh ice shower or you know cold shower ice bath sauna um even isometrics in the gym uh different stimuli that require your, your full attention and presence and we're getting these alterations and emotion and psychology and and mental states and i think that's just really cool that we can do that in a safe and productive way that has uh benefits to our body to our mind um, but also pushes us to think about you know what are the limits to humanity right yeah that's one thing i'll talk to guys about all the time is um i think a lot of people underestimate how plastic the body is you know, mm-hmm. so it'll, it'll become whatever you, you force, whatever, at, you know, outside forces you impose on it or, you know, even environmental, you know, the body's go, going to figure out a way to adapt, you know, so it's, it's just interesting to see what people are doing, and especially with how much communication is possible. You know, I think it's just going to get better and better and better. And that adaptation takes time. I think people want, they want everything now, right? Yeah. But if you have, and I see this all the time in physical therapy, people will come in, their shoulder has been hurting for five years and they want to be better by Saturday. And it's like, even if you do all your exercises every day until Saturday, it's still going to take time to undo all the neglect and lack of strength and motion that your shoulder might present with. It's going to, and people's perception of time, it's uh, looking backwards, it's like, oh, like six months ago, that wasn't that far, you know, but six months from now, that's forever away. But if you give it, you know, weeks, months, years of working on uh, a certain task, you're going to see that change. And then it'll take longer for those adaptations to go away. So like with building strength, you see this all the time, uh, guys who go to the gym, they get stronger, they get stronger, they get stronger. And then they can keep that strength for a long period of time without having to put in as much volume because they built themselves up so much. And I think it's a good reflection for how do we be patient with making those changes? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's one thing where I'll talk to guys about, you know, like the residual training effects and those how long those training effects stick around for. Because everybody, especially the types of guys I'm working with, where they'll they'll think, oh, I need to do more, more, more. I need to go harder, harder, harder. Right. It's like, no, you don't. You're actually going to see a performance decrease. And I don't know how many guys I've had a conversation with where it's like, cut your volume in half, go to the gym half the times that you're doing, that you're going, and I bet you'll see a performance increase. And lo and behold, it happens every time. It's because their body is resting and recovering. Um, but yeah, there, there was something you said a moment ago like about, uh, about injuries and people want to be better right away and whatnot. Have you noticed that people almost tie their identity to their injury? Like oh, 100%. Hundred percent. Yep. They'll say things like, uh, like my tear or, um, if they get an MRI or they get an x-ray, they like know that back and front, they don't know exactly what it means, but they know that they have a disc issue. They know they have, uh, something's wrong with the rotator cuff. They know their meniscus doesn't look great. They definitely tie themselves to that to some degree. And I think a lot of people, really do want to get better and they know that it's going to require a little bit of work. I think the biggest thing, one of the biggest things I should say that I've worked on is I'm here to show you the path and to encourage you to go down that path because it can, I think a lot of people just doubt like this is going to work. Like they know they need to put in some work. They know they need to get a little stronger, move a little bit better. They know they need more consistent. And there's just this little gap of knowing the information and then buying it and actually doing it. And I think so much of my job is a, let's make this simple for you. B let's make it consistent. C let's emotionally tie you to the process of wanting to get better. And hopefully that carries that knowledge of, Hey, I know I need to do my squats. Hey, I know I need to do my stretches. Hey, I know I need to get to the gym three times a week this week. I think, uh, as a therapist, a big part of that is, can we change, can we modify their behavior and their thoughts and beliefs and end up with better outcomes? So uh, how do you go about, how do you go about educating people on that and getting them to, to shift their mindset? Is it a case by case situation where each, each case is different or do you have a, a system that works for everybody? It is. Oh, I wish I had one system that worked for everybody. That'd be nice. It is case by case. So there are some people, and I should come up with names for them. There are some people that they bring the motivation for me. They will do everything I say. They'll probably do double everything I say. They're going to show up early. They're going to have everything. Like they are go getters. And I have to kind of rein them back in because they're going to do too much, especially if they're post surgical. They're going to run too soon. They're going to start squatting too soon. They're going to start throwing a baseball too soon, whatever it might be. So I have to rein them in a little bit. So that takes a acknowledgement of their work ethic, but also making them realize this is how you're wired. And this is usually beneficial for you. But in this case, we have to tweak it and focus on the things that we can do now, not on things that we can't do. Another portion of the population, um, you really have to tie in why do you want to get better? And it can't be as simple as like, I want to go upstairs or I want to, um, I want to get out of the car better. Like those are daily tasks. Of course they want to do that, but it has to tie it into a, like a deeper reason. And so it usually works really well if they, A, are in a sport or activity or B, they have a family member, like they have kids they want to play with. They have a spouse, they have parents that they're looking after. And showing them, if you strengthen your quadriceps, it's going to allow your knee to work better so you can play basketball this year. You can uh, coach your your kid's basketball team. You can uh, take care of your your mom or dad who might need uh, you know assistance. And I think when they realize this is why I'm doing it, it's not the superficial, I'm trying to get uh, my, my, uh, squat better. They're like, Hey, I'm trying to live my life and do the things I want to do. And that can really help kind of with that emotional tie in, uh, 
to improve the outcome of therapy. Mm -hmm. So those are, as far as duration on getting people to shift their mindset, you know, I mean, you, I would imagine, are you having people from what's the shortest amount of time you'll have somebody to the longest that you'll have somebody? Every once in a while, you kind of see it click right in front of you. And they realize you're right. They like, they're like, all right, I, I, I'm going to do this. And that's really cool. That I, I can't say that happens every day. Every once in a while, you just see it in their eyes where they're like, you know what? Like, I need to start doing this. I need to take care of my shoulder. I need to get better after surgery. I need to get back to my activities. Um, otherwise, it, it can take a while. Sometimes it never happens. You know, they just, they just don't. They don't show up. They don't do their exercises. They're late. They make excuses. And that's really hard because it's not, you know, exercises didn't fail them. The, my ability to get them to buy into the process failed. And so I have to get better in that. Um, but sometimes it takes, you know, it, it takes a long time to change behavior. And anybody who has ever tried to uh, change your diet or start a new exercise or start reading more books or, or to get off social media more or get on it more. They, everyone knows this. It takes a long time to change behavior. Um, and it's something, it's really hard. Like as a therapist, if I see you once every two weeks and we do that for two months, that's not a lot of time together. Um, so a lot of that has to come from their own uh, uh, ability to put in the work, to have someone help them put in the work, whether it's a parent or a coach or a mentor. Um, but yeah, it's different for every person. And I think again, at the end of the day, you have to understand, like, am I doing this for a higher purpose than any excuse that might come up? And then the ones that do usually end up doing really well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think to your point, you know, people underestimate the power of small, you know, like 100%. Like, for, for example, you know, read, somebody wants to read more. All right, cool. Read one page today. You know, don't don't worry about trying to read a whole chapter. Yep. You know, because everybody bites off more than they can chew. And um, like all conversations with guys about like we have change plates where we go, you know, there's fifty five pound rogue plates that go all the way down to point two five pounds. And you know, in addition to always always chasing, you know, better technical proficiency, it's like, hey, just put point two five pounds on each side. That's a big difference over time. You know, don't underestimate that. But a lot of it is just getting getting in people's heads about like, you know, being ruthlessly consistent and mm -hmm. you know, sticking with and trusting the power of small. You know. But yeah, man, I mean it was my wife, uh, you know, she's an she's an addictions counselor by trade. And okay. she would work in uh I think it's probably a year and a half ish, maybe two years. She worked in the ER and she would see people come in with that had OD'd or, you know, alcohol poisoning or whatever. And once they got them stabilized and, um, you know, she would come in and talk to the people and say, hey, you know, introduce herself and then say, hey, do you want help? Like, that's the first question. And, the mm -hmm. number of people who said no would just blow you away. You know? Oh my gosh! Wow. Because you have you have people who are not interested in changing their behavior. Sure. They they chase. They identify themselves as you know. Well, I am such and such an addict, and I'm just going to come back here again, whenever. They're not that they, so. It's always an interesting question to me is like, how do you get people to change? What's, what's the driver, you know? That's so hard too, because you can only, as a healthcare provider, um, at some point you can only care as much as your patients do. And if they're not willing to change or if they're not willing to show up or if they have other priorities in life, you you kind of have to let that be and you can try as hard as you can to change it and i applaud everyone who does um but i think that's the hard part is like we like that control like we're we're all helping or we're smart we're educated we're caring um but it's really hard and you probably know this as a parent to 
you want to control someone's behavior and you can't at some point they got to put in as much as you are, if not more. And, uh, it's a hard thing to watch, especially in that situation where that's really life and death situations there, you know, physical therapy. The nice part of PT is, is no one really gets one dies. So, and now patient, at least, you know, everyone, you know, they'll come back. Uh, nothing we're going to do is life or death, but when you're working in the ER, it's, it's life and death stuff. It's really serious. And I, that's a hard thing to manage when you're the one trying to help someone. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, and it's kind of funny, uh, you know, with my kids, cause it's, it really is me like trying to figure out what makes one of them, what makes one tick doesn't work for the other one, mm-hmm. you know? So I can say, Hey, if you do X, you will get Y, you know? And Six year old doesn't care. The three year old is totally like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll go do it. But, you know, and sometimes like even, even coming down to discipline, discipline doesn't work the same for both of them. Mm-hmm. It's just funny to watch and, and try like trial and error each day for me, you know, and same with my wife. She has to try different things each day because they're, they're changing so quickly, you know. Have you read Extreme Ownership? Yeah. Okay, I figured you would, but um, that book, when I was, the, the the content of the book just really changed how I approach like a situation like that. So in the past, I would just blame one of the kids. Like, hey, this kid's just not disciplined. They're not listening to me. With extreme ownership, I think you really have to ask yourself, what can I do different? What can I do better? How can I, am I giving a hundred percent and most, and not, not definitely not judging your parenting, but in most situations for a lot of us, there's more we can do. There's more we can be prepared. There's more we can check in with. There's more research we can do. And that has really helped me a lot in the last, um, several weeks, several months, even over the course of the year. When I have a question for somebody, or if I see something I don't like, I really ask myself, like, what more can I do? Can I, so if I have a question on how to treat uh, a rotator cuff injury, have I even looked up the research on, you know, what's the standard protocol? Have I talked to enough people before just uh, going to my mentor and saying, like, hey, how do you do this? Like, have I done the work? And usually there's more work to be done. And I think the people that embody that are really successful in life. Yeah. Like how have I exhausted all options, you know, and, um, you know, you can just hear, hear Jocko's voice. Like it's all your fault. You, are, <laughs> you know, everything in your life is your fault. And I mean, like, it's, yeah. it's honestly a great concept because, um, you know, outside of like freak show accidents or whatever, but I mean, I mean, pe- people just don't want to, <laughs> I think by and large, a lot of people don't like to admit that, you know, they have to be accountable for their actions and, you know, everything that you do or don't do mm-hmm. comes with consequences, good and bad, because people want to want to do a lot of stuff, but then not have to answer for them later. You know, as an example, like with nutrition, people, man, I would love to eat Taco Bell every day, but... I don't want to have heart disease and be more susceptible to cancers. You know, we were just talking about, you can now, I think we were just talking about it's either, I think it's Taco Bell. They just added a, a subscription model for $10 a month. You get a, a free taco a day. So that is, that might be right up your alley. All right. So there is a Taco Bell close by <laughs> subscription. Taco new, Bell. new sponsor for the podcast, huh? Yeah. TV. What's up, what's up Taco Bell? Um, Going back to excuses, though, I found this a lot with um, when I'm running late to something, I tend to blame the people I'm with, or I blame traffic, or I dream, I blame my car, or I blame, I usually blame something else. And in reality, usually there's something I could have done. I could have prepared the night before. I could have packed the night before. I could have left 10 minutes earlier. I could have checked the weather. I could have checked traffic. I could have had my notes ready to go. Um that is one situation where I've definitely felt like this is usually when I'm running late, it's something I could have done better to avoid that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, perfect example. Like I I was running late, you know, for for this podcast, like a little bit ago. And 
the whole time I'm just kicking myself because I'm like, man, what the hell? Why didn't I, why didn't I look, why didn't I check this place out first to make sure that mm-hmm. it was, had everything? Cause you know, here I am out here in my, my little garage, the lab, you know, <laughs> I mean, it works, but like, it was like, all right, I'd rather be in a heated building, drinking, uh, warm coffee right now. Mm-hmm. But due to my lack of preparation, you know, I'm scrambling around like, hey, sorry, I'm running late. I'm just kicking myself, you know. But it goes back to that that Coach K, you know, where preparation is was one of his keys to success, man. And mm-hmm. you look at him, uh, you know, Saban, all, all those great coaches, man, and they're just preparation masters. And I don't know. I'm excited to see uh... – on Monday, so Alabama plays Georgia again. Yeah, uh, I'm really excited because last time they played a uh, game like this, um, Jalen Hurts got benched at, at halftime, and Tua came in, and yep. uh, and I think there was a lot of preparation for that moment because I assume in that locker room they knew this might happen at some point throughout the season, yep. and I'm excited to see if something like that happens again for either team where you can prepare the best, but did you prepare for the worst situation possible where you're, you're down, you're not playing well, and you need to make a dramatic change? And the teams that tend to have those things prepared, like the Savins and the Belchecks and Gino Ariema, uh, they usually tend to, to be successful over the long term. Yeah, and that that's something we've talked about at work with, um, you know, when, when the Tua – when the two uh, substitution happened, you know, it's like, man, first of all, putting a freshman in that spot, that's, I just, that's, at first you'd think any other coach does that, you're like, dude, you're crazy. Mm-hmm. Nick Saban does it, you're like, all right, he must know something. But then the second, second point is, what's that say about the level of talent that's coming through now? You know, like Ohio State, um, Alabama, Georgia. Like, they can – Michigan. I mean, they can bench any of their starters, and their second strings are just as good. That part's pretty crazy, right? And same with – we're my brothers and I were just talking about Ohio State, where last year, if you look on their roster, they had, um, uh, you know, Fields was starting, Stroud was a backup, and – Jameson Williams was at Ohio State and they had two or three other guys. So over the last, you know, the last couple of years, they have they have guys who are, you know, MVP of the Rose Bowl and things like that. And or, you know, wide receiver of the year, quarterback of the year, things like that, or guys up for the Heisman. And they had those guys, you know, waiting in the wings. So it's amazing how and that takes and that goes back to time. It goes back to uh, the adaptations that we just talked about. It takes time to get to that point. People want it to happen overnight. But if you put in, you know, for those programs, decades of success, you can you're afforded that talent and that luxury and you still have to work hard to make the most of it. Yeah. Yeah, I I think people under they don't realize how like each level of athletics that you go up, you know, there is a clear distinction between uh, the level of skill and talent. Mm -hmm. And it becomes more and more obvious the closer you get to the pros, you know, like you'll see it a lot with D1 guys when they make the leap to the professional, you know, whether it's NBA or NFL or whatever, you see them go in there and they struggle their first year because they're not used to the speed change. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, yeah, man, it's just a different, different game. These these pros that you're playing with now have been doing this for 10, 15 years in some cases. Right. You know, and like, LeBron's freaking 37 years old, man. And uh, what did he drop the other night? 43 points? I just got – I saw him play – couple of weeks ago he is he was up in minnesota and it just yeah it absolutely amazes me year in year out he's at his absolute best he does everything he can it seems like to take care of his body take care of his mind um he switched teams a couple of times but just always seems like he's putting in his best effort year after year at the highest of levels 
and it's really cool to sit back and watch that. Um, yeah. Especially for someone like me who I was born in 91. So, you know, Jordan was coming up through early nineties and um, I didn't get to experience that. So I kind of tell people this is, yeah, like this is my Jordan is, is LeBron because I yeah. didn't get to experience what it was like. And it's different. The last dance was awesome. It was so cool to learn some of that stuff. Um, but when you grow up in an athlete and he's, and he's been, you know, lead for as long, you know, decade, you know, almost two decades now, uh, it's just really cool to see. And, and that really speaks to, you know, performance as a whole, you know, mm-hmm. not, not just in the weight room, not just with sports psychology, but, you know, nutrition, rehab, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, now you have dedicated experts within each specific, specific uh, field. And these guys that are investing the money can stay in as long as they want. Well, not as long as they want, but they can stay in for a much longer period of time because you look at James Harrison, Tom Brady, uh, LeBron, all these guys who invest serious money into their body and, you know, everything's taken care of. It's like, yeah, man, you listen to what these guys are saying. You do the work. Who knows what the limits are at this point? One of my favorite things to look up on social media are uh, quarterback coaches now. It's such a specific niche, but there's so many of them, and there's a lot of good ones. And there, it's uh, obviously it's a high profile position in a high profile sport, but it's so cool to see that niche just blossom in a, in a, the time and space that we have now with social media, with um, the money going into sports, and, and if you have played the position, know a lot about it, know how to make uh, other quarterbacks better. You can make a living off that. Um, so that's kind of one niche that I found a little bit lately. That's wow. This is really cool. You know, growing up, you hear about like one or two of them. And, uh, but now there's, there's just dozens on my feet every day and it's really cool to see. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, who was the, uh, Oh yeah. 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 We were talking. Was, so there's a physical therapist that, works in my office and he's just mm-hmm. right across the hall. Sure. So we'll, we'll talk quite a bit about, you know, what's going on with our athletes and everything. And, um, you know, we were talking about ACLs the other day and, you know, it used to be in like the seventies or eighties, like an ACL. It's probably like a career ending thing or right. at least it's going to be a damn long time before you get back to play. And now it's like, yeah, we're just going to poke like three holes in your leg. Mm-hmm. And uh, you'll be out the same day and back to play much, much quicker. Like, it's just a whole different, whole different deal now. We saw it with Joe Burrow this year. He tore his last year. I think, yeah. yeah, he'll be ready to start next season. It's like, oh, I guess, yeah, I guess they're just ready. To, and then he play, had an awesome year. Um, definitely came on the last couple of weeks. Uh, but you see it with these other guys, you know, Chris Godwin and – um couple other guys you know they get hurt and then like yeah here's the nine month mark and we can expect them to be back full go and do they have a little uh you know maybe a little lapse in play for the first couple weeks or so maybe but next season you expect them to be back it's so cool to see that uh that therapy is advanced in that realm especially for a severe injury like an acl because that is one of the longer injuries to come back from um and it seems like we're getting better we're not perfect but we're better at it yeah yeah we've got we've got an alter g uh in, oh, our, nice. in our rehab room you know yeah. i mean what is it you can offload i think you can offload like a hundred percent but i mean you can take it you can start at a hundred percent go all the way down to body weight yeah and, and run in that thing so i mean it it gets the it's the joint moving you know you know as soon as you want as soon as the pt thinks it's okay to do whatever, whatever protocol. I mean, that's not my scope, but um, I'll be in the room when I'm in watching kind of what's going on. So. It gets that buy-in from the the athlete or the the active person trying to get back to running too. That hey, I can do this a little faster than I normally could on my own. We have this cool equipment, um, and they start feeling better. They start like they're always smiling on it. It's like oh my gosh, this is so fun. I haven't done this in a while. And they want to, you know, push it, push it, push it. Hey, let's do, uh, let's do more next time. Let's do less body weight. And that is a, uh, again, there's so many unique things in therapy 
that bring that kind of joy and uh, experience to the athlete of, hey, I'm feeling like myself again. This is actually pretty cool. We're done doing leg raises and uh, band exercises on the table. Now we're doing the fun stuff. Yeah. But, well, hey, man, I don't want to take up too much more of your time or anything, but um, where's, uh, are you you active on social media? Like where can can people reach out to you, find out more about you and all that stuff? Absolutely. Great question. I am pretty active on social media, mostly, uh, as of right now, mostly on Twitter at Tom Broback. I do have a Instagram handle at Tom Broback as well. You'll find content there. Um, so yeah, the biggest thing I'm just trying to help coaches keep their athletes happy and healthy. Um, I do that, uh, in person, uh, in person physical therapist right now. And I also have a podcast as well. Tom Broback podcast. That's where I talk to coaches uh, trainers, therapists, uh, sport coaches, strength coaches, a lot of different people on how we can make sports performance world a better place. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, want to know more about me, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm pretty good at replying and, uh, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it and excited to see your future content as well. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for coming on, man. And had a good, good visit with you and hopefully we can do this again soon. Awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah.